get started. Uh, thanks everyone for being here. Uh, one of the, you know, the second to last sessions of the day. Um, so my name is Ray. I'm a developer advocate for Google Cloud Platform. And there are two things I like to do. One is to bring some of the best technology that developers uh, can use on Google Cloud or in open source projects like Kubernetes and Istio and things like that. Two developers, uh, especially Java developers. I love Java. This is my language of my choice. I've been in the industry for almost 15 years now and uh, done a lot of development with uh, these type of systems. And uh, one of the things I also like to do is to help and make our Google Cloud products better. And for that reason, I helped start this project called Spring Cloud GCP. So if you're using Java and Spring and Spring Boot, uh, give it a try. You know, check out the project out uh, and let me know how you like it. If you have any questions about this session, you can find me on Twitter at Satanism. You can also find all of the materials and uh, uh, you know, some of the content on my website, which is satanism.me. And today I also have my coworker joining me here. Yeah, as thank well. you, Ray. So I'm Robert Kubis, also a cloud developer advocate. Um, roughly same amount of experience in terms of years in the industry. I went through multiple full stack applications and ended up now mostly in the database and storage space. But like in general, distributed th all distributed things are my my gem. Um, you find me as well on Twitter at at Hossirossi. So if you have any questions around any like database or storage products, let me know. Yeah, so I'm very happy that Robert is able to join me today. Uh, now, I've done this talk a couple of times in the past, and uh, I just want to recognize that, uh, you know, at the beginning, when I, we had the first variation of this talk, I uh, actually did it with Baruch, who's actually in the front here. Yeah, Baruch. Yeah. So, uh, so if you don't like any of the jokes today, uh, it's all his fault. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. We came, we, <laughs> we came up with... the demo doesn't work... It is also your fault. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, so Baruch is here, and uh, we're going to have a lot of fun, I think, because uh, I, I never know what Baruch will do from the audience. <laughs> so here we go. So uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about microservices, and uh, to best demonstrate this, uh, I actually ha had the chance to develop one of the best-looking applications I can ever write. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that, that's what, like, probably a 45 years of experience gets you, right? Like um, <laughs> Together. Thank you. <laughs> two, 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 maybe three colors, beautiful layout. We keep it simple. That's all what I'm hey, about. Hey, right? look. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, I'm not a front-end developer, so this is the best I can do. I went online, I found some bootstrap things and jQuery, and this is what I put together. However, it does demonstrate quite a few things about microservices, because I'm a back-end developer, that is what I do, so I broke everything down into different back-ends. So even though the application is just you know, front-end with the username and you know, message, and you click on the greet button, we're going to call another service to save the data, and then we're going to say hello back to you, and we're going to show you all the messages that's been written so far. And behind the scenes, we're using microservices architecture. So I broke this application down into the front-end with the UI, and two back-ends, a hello world service, uh, a guestbook service that allows you to have CRUD operations. It's going to store the data into MySQL. And of course, we also have Redis for session replications. So so I can hit multiple front end, uh, you know, together, so we can have the same data. So yeah. you have five services for like two lines of application of Hello World. Right, like so some or Baruch might say you could write that in a monolithic app, right? But like, come on, we live in the twenty first century. <laughs> Let's complicate and microservice all the things. <laughs> But however, <laughs> don't do this if you're just writing a guestbook. But this will be a very, very popular guestbook application. So of course, we have to deal with being able to scale out our services independently from each other and so on and so forth. But just keep in mind, you use the microservices architecture for if you are tr trying to solve certain problems. So let's give it a try. So let's see what we got so far. Right? So let's go ahead and see it. Uh, to complicate things matter even more, because it is microservice architecture, you do have to watch out for a few things, like how do you deploy and manage your services uh, in your instances. So for this, we're actually deploying the whole thing into a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, fortunately, I'm running this on Google Cloud, so it's a click of a button, and like my cluster that has about five endpoints, five nodes that I have. And I deployed everything into Kubernetes right now, and the way I've done it is by, you know, one of the things you should be doing is to codify, you know, the, your deployment, and in Kubernetes, everything is done kind of in a YAML file. And so we checked in all the YAML descriptors on what we want to deploy. And the beautiful thing about Kubernetes is that you can actually uh, add some of these uh, deployment descriptors that will you know, describe your desired state. And we can go ahead and conjure up this into reality. Right? So for example, if I need two instances of my UI, I just say I need two replicas of my application. 
And then uh, this is a deployment. I just say which image do I want to use to deploy. And I can configure my environment variables here like to you know, kind of say where the backends are. And I do this for all of my backends and also my load balancers as well. So for example, for my UI service in Kubernetes, I can use the kind of service. And I can say for this load balancer, for this service, I need to load balance behind the scenes to all of the application with certain labels. In this case, it will be Hello World UI label, right? So and I, the yep. really cool thing about this is the load balancer is actually a global load balancer that get provisioned to you, so you don't have to pre-warm anything or like manage with multiple IPs. You get one IP, uh, one IP for your global load balancer, and you're done. Yeah. So here we can actually see uh, the entire architecture. So we have the Hello World service with the this is a load balancer with an IP, and we have two backend instances running. These are the pods. And then this is the deployment, so I can control how many instances I want. And if I scroll down a little bit, I can see the guestbook service as well. I can see two instances there, and I can see MySQL, and everything is running up and running right now. So why don't we just go ahead and take a quick look? Yeah. And um, I, I, I wrote this in Spring and Spring Boot, so you can see very clearly that we have a Spring icon here on the top. So let's go take a look. Oh, yeah, interesting. That, what? What? This is actually working? So that's good. So my hello. And uh, let me say. So when it didn't work oh. last time, it was. Huh. Oh, wait, wait, what? What? Which, what? No, I'm just saying it's great to have a demo that doesn't work from like three minutes in this yeah. talk. Yeah, yeah, but uh, uh, what the? Wait, wait, what did I just do? You uh, broke it. How? How did I break it? I, can you do a hard refresh maybe? Wait, how do you do a hard refresh? Um, shift F5 or something. Shift. I, I could never remember that. Um, I, I don't have that. Oh, it's, you, it's yeah, it's a Mac. Yeah, right? no, like, no, yeah, we, no, we it's are not, not We are not on Windows here, right? Um, um, hmm. But we have a backup video, right? We can just run. <laughs> no, I thought you weren't going to get up. Well, I came in late. What time did you get in last night? Like 11, my the flight was delayed and right. stuff. Uh, dude, I was like outside eating uh, dinner at that time, uh, so. No, I, I never have a backup video. All right, sorry, guys. I mean, five minutes in. It, do you, we have nothing? Yeah. Do, you, do you have something else to do for the next 45 minutes, maybe? I mean, I, w I would send you to lunch right now, but like that, that was like three hours, four hours ago. Yeah, no, no, I guess that's not, not the case. But uh, wait, wait a minute, Ray. Like, what? come on, we live in the 21st century. Like, everything yeah. is like spiked with AI and ML nowadays. It will just fix itself, right? <laughs> you just wait here. For how long? Like, yeah. Just keep refreshing. Like, two minutes, right? No, no, Robert. I don't. I don't think AI can actually fix this for us because this is one of the worst error message I've ever seen. Yeah, if we really customize that page, right? Well, like I said, I'm a, I'm not a front end developer, so this is the best I think I can do. Uh, it's a white label error page. I didn't do any work here. Uh, and mm. and look at that. This is a uh, error with uh, 500 uh, internal server error and a 404 and a 404 on the same page. So I don't know how you get a 500 and a 404 on the same page. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, Baruch, what I is? I have a clue. Yeah. Yes. What? No. So it's no point of exception because it's Java. That's the only thing that we're asserting about. <laughs> right. It, it right. is, in fact, a Java application. Right. Uh, and and you enjoy that so much right now, right? That you totally gonna watch us to debug that for the next forty minutes. Yeah. No. Silently. No, everybody. No. Silently. <laughs> Come on. Like you have seen great <laughs> talks where you run into an issue in a demo, and then the speakers are just like, oh, "Let me fix this. It, only, it will only take five minutes." Yeah, uh, we set the expectations right. It will only take forty minutes to the back. So yeah, so <laughs> asking so, for your patience. So let's let's uh, let's figure this out. I mean, it was definitely working earlier, but uh, I don't know what happened. What just what just happened? So what do you do in this case? Suppose you are actually in a production environment, and somebody tells you they are getting this weird error message on the site. Uh, what do you do? There are so many options we can choose. This is gonna be like almost a choose your own adventure uh, type of deal, but like we need to start somewhere. We, right, we start. but like, I mean, we are experienced developers, right? Right. So who here is deploying to production directly? Are right, you living on the edge, folks? Uh, <laughs> wait, All right, so. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, I, I, I didn't expect to see any hands. <laughs> well, that's great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> Yeah, so usually I start with test, and then I go to staging where I let other people look at it. Uh, um, okay. And then if everything works, we deploy it to production, right? Right. So, 
Um, do we have a staging? Right? You know what? Even though we don't have a backup video, we do have a staging environment. So within Kubernetes environment, uh, where we have multiple nodes, right? We have a whole cluster. Uh, we did actually carve it up into different namespaces. So we actually have a namespace called staging, and this is one of the cool things you can do in Kubernetes is that you know typically people will have a production cluster that only runs production workload, but for non-prod, you can actually share the same cluster uh, via namespace. Right, and it will just like bin pack everything. So like you use the same configuration files that we showed you earlier. You can basically use to deploy to different uh, namespaces. So Ray is going to show here, for instance, you can do the get namespace. You can list all the pods that are running in our staging namespace. You can do the same for QA for production, and we use the exact same configuration files to, to deploy these applications. Yep, and I can also find the service that I provision with the load balancer. In which case. You know, this is prod, which is not working, but if I go to my staging UI, oh, ah. that one's also not working. Ah. What? What is, what nothing, is going no, on here? Nothing is working today. Nothing is working properly today for me, which is kind of weird. And I think I know what happened. I think I know what happened. But this Wait, is weird. So can, can you do like an incognito and let's see if that works maybe in an incognito? Well, let, let's try. So let me see uh, open guest window, yeah. Oh. It works. Okay, we're done. Yeah. Oh, so wait. So it works in staging in incognito window, but okay, that's kind of weird. So what is going on here? Why, why, why does this work here? And oh, I think I know what happened, but uh, but that's weird. So let's assume like this is the you know we got staging environment working and we got pro that's not actually working properly. Right. Uh, what is going on? Wait, does it actually work? I need to say uh, Baruch, and uh, hello. Right. So yeah, it actually writes to the database. So everything kind of works. That's fine. Yeah. So what's going on? We got right. staging, we got prod. Right, so the next thing, like, I mean, we want to find out, like, is actually the same thing deployed to staging and to prod? Yeah, so if you actually have two different environments, and one works and the other one doesn't work, you kind of need to figure out are they the same app, right? Now, no, Robert, actually, I'm pretty sure they're the same app because the way I deployed it was I did kubectl apply dash f, and I deployed exactly the same descriptors, and the only thing different was the staging or QA or something else, right? Okay. Yeah, so, so let's have a look what we deployed. Yeah, so here's my UI deployment, and I can go in and see, you know, again, I can see the replicas, which is here. So I got replicas is equal to two. I got my labels, which is what I'm setting, right? And if I scroll down a little bit, let me just make, yeah, there's no neither. If I scroll down a little bit, I can see the name of image. And now, of course, there's a high possibility because I'm using Baruch's <laughs> artifactory. Right. But, but, but we already established the fact this same image is working in staging. So yeah. let's take a well, look what, at uh, What to tech the right. are you using? Yeah, so I'm using jbaruch. Uh, again, it's Baruch. Uh, Hello World UI. And I'm using the latest tag, of course. L latest, really? Yeah, latest, of course. Because we're in the world where we're always deploying to production directly. <laughs> so we're doing CSDD pipeline. So I'm always deploying the latest version to right, production, yeah. right? Maybe not the best practice. Why? I mean, What's wrong with this? What can so possibly go wrong? What can possibly go wrong? Like, latest is an awesome feature for development, right? Like, it always points to your latest version. But in production, you don't actually know what it really points to. Um, especially, like, if you have a situation where Ray is downloading a container image a week ago, and that is now the latest, and I download one, like, yesterday, and then this is a different version. They all point to latest, but they both point to a different version of the container. So you want to make sure that you use, actually, versions which, in the best case, are actually immutable, right? So that they don't change the container image behind the version doesn't change. Yeah. Or, like, in terms of uh, Docker containers, the other way to be very sure is to just refer to the SHA-256 uh, hash. And then you can just add a hash here if you actually want to be very, very specific about what it is you're deploying. Now, unfortunately, I did not follow these best practices. Obviously, my production environment is kind of broken. Uh, and I think there's ways for us to kind of figure this out, right? Right. So in Kubernetes, you can actually inspect what is running in your cluster, right? So we can do a describe. So you, um, Ray brought up the container that we want to, the pod that we want to actually inspect. We can do a describe of this pod. And then we can su see exactly what is running in, in that pod. Yep. So I do a describe command, and here I can see the details about my deployment. Uh, specifically, I can see the environment the variable. I can see what's mounted. I can see the status. But if I go up a little bit, I can also see the exact image hash that's been deployed. So specifically, we're deploying something from JFrog, uh, with, from Baruch's uh, um, uh, artifactory instance. Um, and then here's the SHA hash. Now, this number is very big. What we need to do is to compare between this and staging. Right. Now, so we need all your help right now. 
So let's do this this way, right? I remember yeah. first five digits. No, you're not. Um, <laughs> raise, <laughs> raise, remember the well, first no. four. Well, you, you, can, you can team up. Yeah, we'll team up. Yeah, got and up. I'm going to remember the last four, and then everybody yeah. else remember everything in between. Something okay. in between. Yeah, pick a, pick a digit. Position does not matter. <laughs> same. <laughs> Just pick a number, keep this in mind, right? So we need to compare the char hash and make zero, sure they're the same thing. You got this? Actually, I didn't get it. One second. <laughs> zero, yeah, zero, three, four, seven. Okay, got it. So now we can go to the, uh, um, let me see here, get pods, and let's go to staging, staging environment, and we're going to find one of the pods to. With a G. Oh, that's good. I thought my staging environment went away. That's. <laughs> It would have been an absolutely unprepared, uh, unfortunately, event if that happened. So let me go ahead and say describe and something from staging. And let's see if this is the same configuration. As you can see, it's hitting the same back end. That's because we had used it in the namespace. So we can share and reuse the same names for because these are all scoped to the same namespace. But now if I go up a little bit, here's the hash of what we deployed. Uh, remember, 0347. 624B yeah. looks good. Everything else in between? Yeah. Yeah, everything's right. good. So we established the fact that this is the same environment in different in space with two different uh, container uh, sorry, with the same container image. So they're exactly the same app. Right. Right. So so then what 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 else should we check in this container image? Like, well, well, what would you do next? I think I would actually go and look at the logs, right? Like that's kind of your next. Uh, step to do and like if you look back oh. like what we would do like 10 15 years ago what would you do you would SSH into a machine you would somewhere <laughs> look for the logs like like a folder directory you don't remember where it was maybe um, and then you go there and use maybe crap to like find what exceptions were thrown in in your application now if you had multiple like instances of that running, you had to basically go to each machine and go through each machine and do this process. If you were really advanced, you maybe had one central server where you use the cron job in each of machine to send your log files to that central server, maybe with FTP or NFS if you're really advanced. But we can do better than that. Yeah. Right. So in Kubernetes, uh, one of the really handy way, of course, is for you to do a kubectl get pods. You can see all the running instances within a namespace or within uh, other namespaces. And if I want to go find the log, this is what I can do. Rather than SSH into that machine and find the files, oh, actually, one of the best practices here is that you should never write the log to your container file system uh, from your application. Uh, one reason is that in a VM, in a machine environment, once you write the log to the file system, you have a log rotator that's able to clean up the logs for you. In the container environment, you don't have these log rotations, and so your file system is going to keep on growing until either it runs out of space or you're, you kill or you start your uh, container, right? And in most cases, what you want to do is to just output the log to std out, in which case you can do something like kubectl logs f, so you can actually see the logs without actually having to SSH into the machine. Now, hold on a second. I got a math question for all of you. We do have two instances on my UI, and I know one of them is not working, potentially. What are the odds for me to find this exception, my stat trace, in one of these two instances? Baruch? 50%. 50%, that's very good, because it is one out of two that I'm going to find. Now, of course, within the microservices deployment, that this is such a super popular application, you may not also, you may not always have just two instances, right? Now, what if you actually have 10 instances instead, right? So now if I go get pods, right, I'm going to see 10 instances running. Now, what are the odds for me to find the, the log in one of the 10 instances? Baruch, you really like to answer questions today. What is it? 50%. You either hit it or you don't. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't make sense, but OK. That, that could be true. I guess that's probability. I'm never really good at it. I'm going to take your word for it. So, so that could be true. I, I would have said 10%, but OK. So, so this is what I do, right? So I can do qctl logs dash f. And I'm going to find one of these uh, instances um, that could be running right now. So I'm going to find one of them that's running. And I can just see the logs this way. And oh, I'm very lucky today, Baruch. 50%. I found you, 50%. Yeah. <laughs> so I should go buy some lottery uh, later today. So I can actually see the log this way. Now, of course, if you have multiple instances running, you can't just you know, do kubectl against every single one of these instances. 
uh, then we got other tools that, for you to do this. Yeah, that would be really tedious, right? Like, so there is a tool actually. There are multiple tools in Kubernetes that you can use. You can use Stern. You can use kubetail to basically to get an aggregated view over all the pods that are deployed under uh, deployment, right? So let's let's use Stern maybe yeah. in our case here. So you basically use Stern, and then the name of your deployment it will basically use like the Q uh, Kubernetes APIs to find out which pods are running under that deployment, and then lists all, aggregates all the logs into your standard out uh, on your local machine from all these pods that are running. However, in a production environment, uh, more than likely, this is great for development, but in a production environment, this is more than likely what you're going to see. And this is when you know uh, something really went wrong, which is exception the whole time. And this will probably like metrics with letters falling down your screen, and you have absolutely no idea where to start, right? right? So, so this like could try, be a big try issue. Try to find that error here in that like metrics and like pinpoint it, and then yeah, yeah, difficult. So that that's not gonna do so well. So here's the beautiful part about Kubernetes is that if you do actually output your uh, your logs as STDR or STD error. Typically, you can actually install a centralized logging environment. So for example, if you're on-prem, you probably have Elk Stack, Elasticsearch, Logstash, and uh, Kibana, and where they can centralize and aggregate all of your logs for you and be able to search and debug and figure out what is going on. Now, because we're running this on Google Cloud Platform, we actually have a centralized logger pre-installed. Uh, if I were to provision this automatically, uh, it would be done for me. So we can actually go to what we call stack driver logging, uh, in this case, because I have this pre-configured. Uh, kind of came with uh, the thing, and yeah. we can go ahead and find the log this way. Yeah, so basically everything gets collected, or everything gets sent to stack driver logging, and then we basically, we can drill down in stack driver logging, we can go out to our cluster, the Kubernetes container, the demo2 cluster, we go to our namespace, and then we go to our deployment that we have. Okay. So here in this case, we do the Hello World UI deployment, and now you have all the aggregated logs from all our parts in, in this UI, and you can do search. So we can, for instance, do a search for exception, or for our 404, or 500. And so we see like our logs, and we can find the logs and see a bit about what is going on. But there's one thing which is a little bit complicated here, right? So um, you see all the logs aggregated, but you don't really have an idea. Is that actually a localized problem? Is that maybe like one part that is going rogue, or is like all our parts going rogue? And you have a story about this, like. Yeah. So, so for example, um, I was working as a consulting a hospitality company, hotel company, and uh, it was a monolith. So even back then, right, it, it doesn't really matter whether it's a monolith or a distributed system like today with microservices, right? You have multiple instances. You kind of need to figure out what is actually going wrong. So what we used to do, unfortunately, back then was also SSH into the machine, right, aggregate all the logs, FTP them down, and then do a grip, or I write a pro code, or even I dump it into Hadoop and try to do some of these analysis. Uh, what I really want to find out at 2 a.m. in the morning was, am I going to stay out all night, or is it just one instance that's being misconfigured? And this type of analysis is really, really useful. And uh, there are actually ways for us to do it very easily. Now, again, if you have a centralized logging environment, uh, this is what they should be allow you to do, right? So for example, we can run analysis on our logs uh, from here, specifically if you're using Stack Driver Trace, where we can potentially export the log to like a messaging system so you can do real-time analysis on what's happening in your system. Or you can save it to long-term storage so you can analyze it later. Uh, but one of my favorites is actually I'll put it to BigQuery in this case, where we can actually do um, you know, a SQL uh, commands so we can actually run SQL analysis on our log messages, which is super, super useful. Right, and so the really cool thing here is that uh, if you export it to BigQuery, it creates a table for you. It actually partition, like, partitions a table by day. Um, it creates all the columns for you, and so you, are, you literally just have to write the SQL statements to aggregate across your logs. Okay. But the, the point here, though, is that you want to, uh, you, you need a place kind of where you can go and figure out and analyze the log and potentially get some metrics and data retroactively that you may not as otherwise be able to get. Now, BigQuery, though, is something that we actually uh, developed within Google. It used to co be called Dremel internally. This is where we can actually go and you know, debug our applications and query our logs to figure out uh, what may have run, gone wrong and stuff like that. And the beauty of BigQuery is that it doesn't matter how much data you have. Uh, it's always the same speed, in, well, it's similar speed in when, you know, how, how much we can actually process and get the data back. So typically for this demo, uh, if I want to query Wikipedia data, it will be like 500 terabytes of data, and we can do SQL queries you know, that will complete in like 10 seconds or so, all without any indexes. 
Now, for our little application here, I have written a query here that I can analyze my logs, which is going to be a little bit useful. So what this query will do is to basically go and find all the log entries from my cluster that belongs to my Hello World UI container from today that has the text payload of exception. And we're going to find all the pods that has this error. And we're going to order the counts in descending order. So hopefully you can find maybe there's one that just gone rogue. Right? So I'm going to go ahead and run this thing. Of course, I don't have so much data. But imagine if you actually have terabytes of data here, we can run the query for you uh, just the same. Yeah, and it looks like we have like two pods that are really out of bounds. Huh. Right? Interesting. So, so you know, maybe maybe there are two or one instance that's just like going rogue. And uh, let's see what we can do. So, what should we do about this instance, Robert? This is yeah, like two a.m. So in the morning. Also have exceptions, but yeah, but that, that's so we'll it's out. kind of normal, yeah. right? Like you have a little bit of errors you have in every application. Yeah, so. but but these two are really just out of out of order, right? Yeah. So um, I would like in, Kube, in in Kubernetes, you can basically just delete it, right? Delete. So something like kubectl delete, and uh, we can do delete the pod. But wait a second, Robert. If I delete the pod right now, Kubernetes will get rid of this container instance and restart another one for me. Let's assume this is the, the reason. I mean, I'm not going to see the issue now. But what, ha what if it happens again tomorrow? Uh, we do the same thing. It delete again? <laughs> yeah. What about next week? Well, if, it, if it's so regular, then the, the only solution that I can think of is uh, setting up a cron job and <laughs> do that every three Like days. you do <laughs> with, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, how many people here have a cron job that deletes their application? Seriously? Are you the same people who deploy to prod directly? This is how you fight Java memory leaks. I, I remember you do that too, right? You, now, hold on a second. You have a cron job. I remember, I saw that earlier. No, hold on a second. I your for job. the record, for the record, uh, what is that file? Cronjob.yaml. For the record, you can actually have a cron job in Kubernetes. But you should not be using it to delete your pod every week. For the record, I'm just going to say it out loud no, right just, here. Just I'm, kill all Java. Yeah, okay. Don't, 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 don't delete do that. the pods. Why, why don't you want to do that? Because if you delete the pod and it happens over and over again, you never really find the root cause of the issue. Right? We really don't want to cron job this. Right. So you basically bury the evidence for your crime with it. Um, and so we actually want to investigate. So there's actually a really cool tool in Kubernetes. What you can do is like we know like there is one pod or maybe two pods that are rogue, and we don't want to have these pods anymore serving traffic to the uh, to the outside world. Yeah. So what we can actually do, we can see here we have our service YAML, and that defines like uh, like in the spec has basically a selector. So these are the labels that we attach to our deployment, and we say in our service like okay the service may matches all the pods that have the labels Hello World UI and serving true. Now, if that doesn't 100% match anymore, then the service will not route traffic anymore to our pods. Right. So we can use this um, to look at our pods, which have right now the serving label. Yeah. So here, I just issued a command line here. So I want to see all the serving label that's being set. So my Hello World UIs all have the serving labels of true. That means every one of these uh, backend might potentially be getting one of these requests and returning this issue. If I actually suspect one of these instances is going rogue, I need, really want to like, isolate it and prevent it from serving traffic. This is what I can do. Uh, I can also, whoa, what just happened? Uh-oh. This is, yep, this, this is what I can do. I can use the command line here to call kubectl label. I can label the pod. Basically, I can update the label to what I want it to be. So for example, if I suspect one of these instances having issues, I can set the label serving uh, to false instead. I'm going to override it. And this is now effectively taken out of my service. So I cannot get to this via my load balancer anymore. So if I zoom in a little bit here, I can see now effectively this particular instance has the label of false, so nothing will get there. Right, and you see also like we have one line which where we have a pod which is only four seconds old. And the reason for this is like in, in Kubernetes, you have a deployment where we said like we want to have 10 serving replicas for that deployment. Since we took out one of the uh, pods uh, from that deployment, the deployment basically says like, oh, now I have only nine serving pods for this deployment, so I have to start a new one. So it starts a new one, and we can see we now have 10 yep. uh, serving and one which we took out of service. Right. So now, even though I took out the service, uh, my app's still not working, which is kind of weird. But we can also, now we have this 
particular instance isolated. It's not, no one else is getting it. So what we can do is to send requests to this specific instance to kind of see what is going on. Okay? And the way that we can do it is by using something uh, that's built into Kubernetes, which is by pull forward. So we can pull forward uh, traffic. Pull forward? Forward with an R pull, in there. Yeah, oh, I can't spell. Yeah. I can't do math and cannot spell today. Uh, I'm going to pull forward directly into the pod. I'm going to bind it to my local host. I'm going to my local host 8080. I'm going to pull forward via a secure tunnel into the Kubernetes um, the cluster into that specific pod on that pod's port 8080. And now, One if I command. look at the, uh, yeah, now if I go to the local host 8080, this will only send to the traffic to that specific instance. Right, and yeah. it's, it's one command. Just imagine you would have to pipe and set up all this yourself to like a pod which is running in one machine somewhere you don't really even know. One command and we pipe directly to this pod. Yeah, and uh, apparently this instance works. Hello. Yeah, right? Awesome. Okay, that's kind of weird. That's that you decided it doesn't work? Yeah, that's the one I, I think that doesn't work. But uh, now by through this uh, isolation mechanism where we can validate our assumptions and maybe that's not the issue. If you kill your pods and restart it, and maybe you'll never figure this out, right? So, okay, so this actually works. All right, oh. so we, we basically, we have our pod, that pod works, our application doesn't work. Um, we figured out in the beginning we have a microservice application. So there's probably a lot of things going on, yep. right? But, but before we move on, should we, what should we do with this pod? Oh, right. Um, well, we can just put it back, right? It works, we verified yeah. it works. Yeah, so here we have two options. We can either uh, just delete this pod for real now. Now we kind of figure out what's wrong with it. Oh, one more thing is that in addition to pull forward, you can also exec into it. So you can do something like exec TI, and rather than you know, SSH into the machine, figure out where they are at, you can just exec into this container directly, and all of a sudden now you're inside of this pod, and you can see what is actually running. You can see if you have Hopefully you don't have logs, right? But if you do have something written to the disk, you can take a look at it. Or if you want to do a thread dump, you can do a kill three. If you've got just that, you can do the debugging this way. So you can do a lot more once you're in the shell of this instance. So one word of caution. Um, I went to a company and showed that there, and somebody from like uh, the architects came up, um, or DevOps field came up afterwards, and it's like, you should have never showed that. Um, please, please, please <laughs> don't use that in production to make any changes to your pod. Yeah. You're never going to find what's happening, right? So this is really just for inspection to like see what's happening. But please, please, please don't use it to make any changes to your prod pods. Right. And now we kind of uh, figure out what is going on. This thing is perfectly fine. Now we have the option to put it back into service or I can simply delete it. If I delete it, it will just be gone. But if I want to put it back into service, it's not actually guaranteed that's going to happen. So for example, uh, if I do the serving, I can actually put the serving flag equal to true, okay? And then if I do the logs, uh, if I get pause again, uh, what I'm going to see is, wait a second, I, I had 10 instances, one of them was false, and now I set it back to true, and now I still have 10 instances, what happened? Right, so like now basically what happened is like the deployment sees that now I have suddenly 11 instances, 11 pods running, but it only needs 10. So it has to figure out to basically uh, stop one of the pods. So usually what it does, it looks at like, do I have any non-ready, unhealthy pods that I can stop? And if they all are ready and healthy, it basically looks at like, what is the one that has the lowest runtime and then stops that one. Yeah. So, so we can see that it effectively removed uh, one of the instances for me. So it maintains the fact that I have 10 instances together. Okay, so we check a lot of things so far. We, we made sure that they're the same application. Um, oh, one thing we didn't see is what was actually inside the container. Um, right. Yeah. yeah. Mm. But, but we can, we can, like, if we want to, we can grab that hash, we can go to Artifactory, I can do a search, I can figure out what version the latest actually means, I can also go inside of that container and figure out what is actually running inside of this container, what version of the jar file am I using, right? We can do all of that within Artifactory as well. Um, but given that we may have done that already, we, we are pretty sure that everything is working. Uh, you know, our pods are just this is still not working, Robert. Like, right. what is going on? So the local pods, like the ones that we isolated, they work, right? Um, but the entire application doesn't. So we need to, like, we want to find out, like, is there anything, like, on a connection basis that is going wrong, right? Okay. Like, we want to get a little bit more insights into, like, are the pods actually and the services talking to each other? So that's where we can actually go back to our beautiful application here. Yeah. 
So, so yeah. in here, uh, Robert, like, because it is a complicated architecture, you kind of never know who's actually making the call, right? It, like, who's actually calling my service? Um, but luckily enough, I have my documentation here. This is a UI that will give you almost real-time stats. So here we had two instances, now we have 10. I can see very clearly that the lines are drawn, like my Hello World service UI is actually talking to my SQL or to Hello World service and to my Redis and stuff like that. So yeah, it can looks, we go it from there? It looks like you did that in Visio and you just update your Visio. This, like, this is totally not Visio. No? This, this is real time. This is near real time, right? All right okay, I, I saw that the pods are updating, so I give right. you that. But like all the other lines, what about the other lines? The, these lines? Well, so here's the trick. Uh, unfortunately, you caught me, Robert. So for example, these lines are actually hard-coded, I have to say. So what happened in this visualization tool is that I hard-coded the fact that my app is talking to these other services. So how would you actually know this is real? Now, in a typical situation, how many of you actually had this happen to you? You are trying to troubleshoot something in a complicated architecture, and you go off to a documentation. And then maybe two hours later, somebody taps on your shoulder and say, yeah, that doesn't happen anymore. Right? Like, that documentation is outdated. Right. Especially the ones that deploy <laughs> direct to production. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> but <laughs> documentation is definitely up to date. Yeah, who, who here like, keeps the documentation? Who of the developers here keeps documentation up to date always? You're an exception. You're amazing, um, yeah. right? Like it's usually, very hard to do. usually yeah. documentation is outdated the moment you write it. Yeah. So, so we, we want to get some little bit more real time insights. Here. Exactly. So there are a few tools that we can use, right? Uh, one of them is pretty cool. It's called Weave or Weave Scope. Uh, this is a little plugin you can a component you can add into your uh, cluster, and what that allows you to do is to actually see some of the real time connection information. Uh, that the application is, sta is uh, establishing, right? So for example, here I can zoom in a little bit. I can see all of the different uh, services I have. I can see Hello UI talks to the debugger. Okay, that's kind of cool. And, and check this out. If I were to pull this out, and if I were to do a quick refresh, um, and we should be able to see the connection being established, and we should be able to see a new line being drawn. And did you see that? Right, so we can pretty much sure, be sure that the, the network connections are going through, and um, you know, there's nothing happening in my infrastructure that's causing something fishy. Right, so, so this is cool. Like we see like TCP uh, connections basically going on, services talking to each other, but we really don't know on a request level like who, like what service is talking to which service based on a request level. So we, we want to actually get a little bit more insight even on, on the request level to see like what is going on. Right, and to do that, uh, what we need to do uh, is what we call distributed tracing, right? And actually, distributed tracing is not new. I remember even in consulting, I was in this uh, service-oriented architecture uh, deployment, and the first thing that my manager from a consulting told me to do was to make sure that I have an ID that's unique per request, and then I propagate this ID downstream to the other services I'm calling. Um, and this was many, many years ago. I'm like, why should I be doing this? Well, so he gave me two answers. Number one is, well, what if one of the services had issues? How would you know which one actually broke, right? So having a single correlation ID, I can kind of figure that out, right? Uh-oh, what just happened? Oh, no. Oh. Right, and, and that is actually amazing to have, but like as, as you can tell from the description how uh, Ray was talking about this experience, it was basically a thing at the organization where they set up a policy which everybody had to follow. You had to basically decide like who is the one who generating that ID so <coughs> that you don't have like multiple servers generating individual IDs and then you have for one request multiple IDs and you have to figure out how they belong to each other. Right. So um, we have advanced in that like way like a lot nowadays, like you have a lot of libraries that you can just tag on to your application, and that application basically, uh, that library takes care of all the metadata for you. It, it adds all the like IDs and and all the things for you. Yeah. And uh, so, for example, if you're using Spring and Spring Boot, you can use uh, Spring Cloud Sleuth. Otherwise, you can use Brave and stuff like that. Or you can also deploy your stuff into Istio in case if you propagate the right headers, we can automatically. Uh, propagate the traces for you uh, to store them and collect them. Now, this is what ultimately you're going to get. If you're on-prem, you're probably using something like Zipkin or Jaeger. Uh, on, on the cloud, you can do and you can use one of our services, which is called Satch River Trace. Uh, the result is going to be the same. What you really want to be able to see is what happened in this call, who is actually being slow, or is there anything that's broken? Now, 
I have many, many traces here. So every one of these dots is a trace that came through from my system. And I need a way to kind of navigate this a little bit. Right. So we want to filter down, right? So here we can actually filter down on the HTTP status that we have. So we can filter down on the 500s that we were seeing. We can click on one. And then you see literally like a waterfall of what is happening in terms of the requests, which services we're calling which, and where is any issues. Yeah. Right. So here we have the, the, the UI that's calling the Hello World service. And um, for this particular thing, we can see that this is, in fact, Hello World service. And I can drill in a little bit. And if I drill in to the end, Check this out. This response time is really, really fast for some reason. And we can actually find that yeah, the status code is actually 404. So this 404 code was um, you know, it's cascading upwards to the actual UI. And this is what caused my 500 in the first place. So in many cases, having some of these um, traces is going to be very helpful in terms of uh, finding out where in the chain of the code actually broke. Right, so we now know that it's like broke down there, but we don't know what caused it, right? So we want to get a little bit more insight, like how do we find out what actually caused that 404? Right. So, so for that, we may actually need to know the parameters actually actually being sent in. Now, you, you either put the parameters in one of these annotations so you can store that with a trace, or if you forgot to do that, well, I you guess don't really want to do that always out. because you have to also be careful with PII and things like that. Yeah. So, but yeah, I mean, like, what would you do? Um, if you like, need more information from your app and your log does have, doesn't have those messages right now, uh, what would you do next? We would add some logs, right? Some log messages. So, like, who here in the audience can deploy within an hour to production? Yeah. Wow. We have Very like, nice. a, like a really cloud native crowd here. Yeah, that's uh, awesome. Hello world, easy. <laughs> <laughs> microservices? Hello world with microservices? <laughs> Still under an hour. Still under an hour. That's very good. Yeah. <laughs> All right. That that is impressive to say. Like, but there are some folks out there that need need more than an hour, a week, maybe or like a day or a week, right? So. But but even within an hour, what you still have to do is that you want to make sure you check out the revision that actually is in production, and then you do a hot patch into that to add additional log messages that somebody would have to then approve, and then you push that into production, right? Yeah. In order for you to get find out more information. Um, and that whole cycle can be tedious. And if you cannot do this within an hour, maybe the issue went away. Maybe a lot of people are angry already, and you just don't know what's going on. Right. right. So you want to have something actually like which gives you the possibility to do that a little bit more interactive, a little bit more quicker. Yeah. And we actually have something where you can add log messages on your production application. So we can go into given, the stack driver debugging. Yeah. G given the right uh, permission, this is what you can do. Given that you are in a pinch, you are out of all of your options, uh, and you just really want to add a log message, given that you have the permission to do it, um, you can actually do it. So every one of my applications right now is running with an agent behind the scenes, uh, is J a JVM agent. And this agent is hooked up to our debugger right now. And this allows us to do two different things. The first one is that we can actually add log messages. So, so we. Um, we have three different services here. We can see Hello World UI, Hello World Service, and so on and so forth. I can click on any one of them. And what happened behind the scenes is that I encoded the GitHub repository and the Git commit hash into my jar file so that the debugger agent can actually infer. And so when I connect to this console, it will automatically download and pull down the right revision of my code. This is really cool. Now, if you don't have access to that, then what you can do is just upload the right revision yourself. Okay, or you can do this from the IDE directly. Okay. Right. So now we have all the code available to us. Let's just go ahead and find logs. Now, Robert, how do we actually debug this with log messages? Well, I usually, like, I'm a big fan of, like, print down logging. Um, okay. Who, who else? Print. Awesome. Yeah, but, but it's got to be a strategy to do this, right? Yeah, you're, are you... Are you level up. Yeah. Well, creep alerts. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, but unfortunately, so, I cannot do alerts here, but I can do print log debugging. But there's got to be a strategy. Yeah, so my strategy is usually like binary search. Binary search. Binary search debugging. How do you actually do that, Robert? So you start with a log message at the beginning at the end. OK, so, so I'm at the beginning. I'm, I'm here. And then uh, something at the end, yeah, you said? Yeah, before the return, you say OK, like, so I'm uh, like, uh, like two, success. Uh, it works, or a success. Yeah. OK. And then what do you mean by binary and, thing? And, and then you just like go halfway and then put something in halfway. Right? I see. So if it doesn't get to the bottom, that means it must be somewhere in the middle. So you add something in the middle, like right here. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, that's, and that's there we actually cool. have the name. Uh, like, so maybe we can yeah. point so out Yeah. So I'm going to say, um, maybe it broke here, right? 
And we're going to say the name is, I'm going to use the, the expression here to put the, to print out the, the name. Now, just like that, every time I'm adding a log message, again, provided you have the permission to do it, every time that I go through this line of code, the log message will be printed as well. So this is really, really useful. If you are absolutely in a pinch, you really have to figure this out. Uh, this is what you can do. So how do you actually find the log? Well, you can go to the logging console, of course. We can go to, you know, to your centralized logger. It doesn't matter which one you're using. And uh, if I scroll down a little bit, uh, I should be able to see, ah, right there. What is this? Log point. I'm here. I'm here. Right, that's pretty cool. And uh, where's the second entry here? Uh, maybe it broke here. The name is empty. Empty. So user error. Yeah. So somebody didn't put in the username. Who's, I wonder who's who user? that is. Yeah. Interesting. Who broke the demo for the whole hour? Okay. So that's pretty cool. So you can actually figure out what people actually entered uh, if you're in a pinch, right? It, again, if you have the permission to do so. But we can do better. Yeah. We can one step more. Yeah. Right. So, so for example, how many people be here? We kind of like sometimes want to attach a production debugger into your production app to see what's going on. Yeah, yeah, you kind of want to do it, but nobody want to do it. Why don't you? Why can't you do it? Well, why why can't you do it? Why can't you do it? Well, every time if you enter a breakpoint and when somebody steps, you know, come through the the code, what's going to happen? Well, it stops. It sends me a notification. I go to my laptop and step them through. Step them through, and how long will that take? So the user will see an empty page until you step through the code? Sounds like job security to me. <laughs> so every time there's a high latency, they'll call you up, and you'll step through the code and increase the latency, and that's how you keep your job. Right, that's right. awesome, Robert. May maybe not the best. <laughs> so we can do better. So at Google, we actually use the same debugging agent um, in our production environment. We can actually take something that's called a snapshot. So rather than stopping the world, we can take a snapshot of your running instance with the exact state that actually went through without stopping the world, and now you can actually uh, have a really good visibility into what's going on. So for example, if I go to the Hello World service code here, and want to take a snapshot of what's actually being sent uh, for my REST template, I want to see the endpoint and the name, uh, I can print it out, or I can take a snapshot like that, and I can go back to my application, I can do a refresh, now watch very carefully. Do you see that? It yeah. just took that snapshot, and I can see the variable that's in scope, which is name, and I can see the code stack of what happened in my application. Now, I cannot step through it, but if I want to see multiple snapshots, I can just add multiple snapshot points like that, and then I can go ahead and do the refresh, and I can take a snapshot at every single one of these moments in time, which is really, really use useful in some cases. Okay? Right. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Very cool. So, so we established the fact that it was a user error, and I can tell you why this is actually happening, and why when I went into the incognito window actually works. Now, unfortunately, this, is a, this was a real bug that we discovered during one of the, re, uh, the presentations, and unfortunately, we didn't get to fix it during that presentation. What we did is to go back and say what's going on, and the reason this is happening is because in the username field, I entered empty, and because I have session, I have session that's being stored and have empty session the whole time that has an empty username, and uh, my Hello World service did not like that. And this is why the error actually propagated upwards to our application. Now, I would not have been able to debug it actually for myself uh, afterwards uh, without using some of these techniques, actually. Okay? So now let's go. We can start the talk. Yeah, now we right. can start the talk. <laughs> now, we fixed it <laughs> now we fixed this app. If I start a new incognito window, I should be able to see uh, everything working, right? And this is uh, what we have done earlier. So if I go here, and we can see this, everything is actually working with the new window because right. now I have a new session. Right. So right. what did we went through? What did we learn in the session, right? So first and foremost, collect logs. Uh, send them to standard out. In Kubernetes, you basically have log collectors that either send them to your Elk stack or, in our case, to, to Stackdriver, where you can search through these logs, where you can export them to, for instance, uh, BigQuery to do a more aggregation and analysis of this. 
Yep. And um, for, um, for service to service calls, it could be useful, uh, not only if you have monitoring tools, like so you can collect some metrics from Prometheus or something else. Uh, that's typically useful if you need to know like percentage of failure rates and stuff like that. But if you want to know like at request level what actually is going through, uh, what is actually causing a lot of issues, uh, you should sample your traces. Uh, typically in a production environment, you don't sample everything just because you don't have space and time to store every single trace. So you probably take a percentage or a probability of that. Uh, in our demo, we sampled 100%, and we can actually go back to a single trace and see what actually happened in between. Yeah, and last but not least, um, debugging. Like, there are a lot of tools out there. In our case, also, again, with the integration into Stack Driver debugging, you have the possibility to add live uh, log messages to your application in production. And even one step further, you can take snapshots of uh, what is running in your application and see what is the call stack, what are the variables that are set uh, at that moment in time. Yeah, and uh, finally, if you want to have a health a view of your entire cluster. Uh, what you should also have is a monitoring tool for the entire Kubernetes cluster. Now, of course, there are many, many tools out there. Uh, StackDriver also has that as well. So this is uh, you know, pretty much a full suite if you are running on Google Cloud. But otherwise, you can find the comparable open source projects to help you debug and troubleshoot your services within uh, your own deployment as well. And with that, I think our time is up. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you. And uh, yeah, thanks for having us here. Right. And uh, thank you, Baruch. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs>